awesome. So uh, I thought we would do a, a tag team American Albanian sermon today. That'd be pretty, pretty fun, right? Yeah, you're, you're always ready, man, I know. Now, so uh, you may have heard in the announcements earlier that we have a information meeting today about uh, learning more about our partnership, our mission partnership with Albania. Does anybody actually know where Albania is? It's not bad, Aldo. I mean, there's a few people, a few people know where it is. Who wants to just go ahead and just be honest? Like, I have no idea where Albania is. Somebody would just, yeah, see? We're, we try to encourage honesty here in our church, Aldo. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but no, this is Aldo, and uh, he is uh, from Albania, just flew in Friday night, so probably still a little bit of jet lag, still recovering. You look pretty awake. You've had some coffee, probably. But uh, Aldo, our, uh, our group, we had a group from Stonebridge, I'll say a little more about that, got to participate with Aldo over in Albania this past summer. He's on staff with Crew over there, and they're doing just an amazing job. We, there's just such a window of opportunity in this very small country, right above Greece, kind of right across from, uh, how do you describe the boot of Italy? Oh, well, the Texans usually would remember better this way. Well, Italy is like the boot, yeah, right? It has a heel. Today, actually. Yeah. yeah, Brian is prepared. <laughs> so, like a cowboy would spur backwards, the horse, yeah, that's how nice. Albania, I mean, uh, Italy would point to Albania, so the heel of Italy. That's pretty good. It's a little more like, yeah, yeah. There you go. That was good, Aldo. Nice. All right. Yeah. So that's where Albania is. Small country, but an amazing spiritual hunger in this place. They were under communism for a long time, even declared it an atheistic nation. But of course, we have been created for a relationship with God. And so people are hungry. And so it's just a ripe opportunity. It's an amazing partnership. And Aldo and the crew over there is just so much fun and just a joy to get to work with. So we love the friendship that God is building here. And so Aldo is great. And he's also a dad. He has everything from a nine-year-old all the way to a two-year-old. So uh, they're right in that phase, but I, I know he loves being a dad as well and, and uh, you know, being able to raise up the next generation part of that. So Aldo, uh, if you would, just tell us a little bit about what the Stonebridge group got to be a part of over the summer, just so people can kind of know what, what happened in our trip that we did. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Well, howdy, y'all. <clears throat> Thank you Damn. for having me again. <laughs> That's really good, by the way. It's the use been... of the y'all. He has studied the Texan culture very carefully. I so love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, it's been a year since uh, my last visit here, yeah. being on uh, stage. Uh, and when I think of the partnership with Stonebridge, you know, it just brings me uh, uh, in mind of the Apostle Paul. You know, he was praying and seeking to go in Galatia, in Asia Minor, to visit the churches, plant more churches. And then he had a dream, a vision. And it was a Macedonian man that said, come and help us. You have that in Acts uh, chapter 16. And then he is obedient and he goes. And because of that, the gospel goes to Europe. It came to my country. So I kind of feel like that, you know. I came here last year, and I asked, come and help us, Stonebridge. And you replied. And then we had a team of 11 that came to Albania just a few months ago in the summer, where we had an amazing, amazing time of summer camp reaching to high school and college students. We went camping. We loved on students. And again, I repeat this, that a lot of those that have no idea who God is or come from broken families that do not really know or experience love and so your group has helped us love them well with the love of Jesus and share the gospel with them that's awesome that's awesome and uh I heard even that David Whitmire I know was a part of that group and uh, plans on returning again is there are there any uh embarrassing stories or things we should know about David his um, life in Albania uh, those that, those are classified oh, okay <laughs> so only nice. good stuff only, only good, good stuff, stuff. Right, awesome. I respect but that but yeah well that. one of the things that I would share is that we had so much fun we like to dance in Albania we love to have coffee hang out with students and David and Brent witnessed uh, uh, a good opportunity to share the gospel with students and two boys received Christ that's cool and they're continuing, you know, being followed up uh, through our staff and going through Bible study because we just don't want that seed just to be planted, but we want it to grow and bear fruit. And so we built a nine square uh, uh, game there, you know, uh, helped arrange some of the storage units, set up chairs, and set up the camp for success. And over the summer, 
we've had more than uh, 1,200 people that have gone through our wow. projects. And just at the, at the beach camp that we're developing, over 800 people went there. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, cool. So bring us up to speed a little bit, Aldo, since our group came back in late June. What, what's been going on? What are some highlights that you want to share with us? I would say I'll share three. Okay. Uh, one is a um, pretty big highlight for us and a, uh, like a milestone is the completion of a, uh, a dining facility at uh, the beach camp, the lighthouse camp that we're developing. And now it provides a good, good uh, facility for people to come in for camping, not just in the summer, but also all year, all, all year around. You know, it has AC. And um, really was a God's testimony because all the odds were against, you know, apart from funding, uh, it was uh, time frame and the bu bureaucracies of corruption, you know. But the Lord made it happen, and we got to celebrate as hundreds of people were able to go there and hear the gospel. Awesome. Secondly is that um, um, we were able to send over 100 Albanians on short-term missions hmm. this past year. That in is, the east. That is awesome. <laughs> and in the west, reaching out to the international hmm. student population. And that's what is really fascinating to me and I'm encouraged and continue to press on is that mm. what we're doing together, accomplishing to reach Albanians, it doesn't stick there. Yeah. We have a global vision. We're a small country, small people group there, but God has called us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? Mm. And so we want to take that seriously. And yeah. thirdly, as now the, you know, we're back, school has started, university has started, we've had several outreaches. Um, reaching out to uh, college students on campus, especially those that are freshmen, hmm. and already have seen um, dozens of students come to Christ. Just last hmm. week, there were five that's uh, awesome. that said yes to the Lord. Praise God. <laughs> that is so cool. Well, hey, that's awesome, man. Yeah, we can give, give a hand to that. So cool. Well, uh, as we announced earlier, David mentioned, if, uh, if you're interested in potentially going, stepping out of your comfort zone, going to another part of the world where God is at work, I would encourage you to go to our info meeting. It'll be right after this service. They'll even feed you pizza. So at the end of the day, you know, you get some free pizza. So what could go wrong? Uh, even if you just wanna learn more about it, it's a fascinating story, what God is doing in this country. And, and just go get to meet Aldo. So I think you'll really, really enjoy that, getting to know him and his story more. That'll be up in room 207. Uh, anyone is welcome to come to that. And also, we're gonna have an opportunity, I think, uh, during our Christmas giving to have some ways that we can actually give towards some of the vision that God is doing over in Albania, this lighthouse camp and different things that they're doing to reach people. So you'll hear more about that as well. But if you would join me, let's just pray for Aldo and what God's doing over there. Father God, we thank you so much for this partnership and this friendship that you have brought these, uh, this church here in the Woodlands area, and you've connected us all the way over to Albania with Aldo and those over there. And uh, Lord, I just pray your blessings on his family as he is uh, seeking to be a godly dad. I pray that you would meet his needs, that you would provide for this vision to reach more and more people for Christ. And it's so encouraging to think about not only does that affect Albania, but Lord, you are putting that desire to send people out all over to the surrounding nations, all over that area. What an impact that is making for Christ. And so uh, thank you for him. I pray you'd bless his trip while he's here and uh, just show us how we can continue to partner together. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's thank all thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank all you. Though. Thank you all. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, we are, uh, like I said earlier, we're starting a brand new series today called Real Living. And I, I love this idea because I think it's something that we want. We wanna figure out how to really be alive, how to really live. But I think we struggle to figure that out. You know, if we really, you look at the state of our world, the state of people, there's a lot of anxiety out there. There's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of disillusionment. There's a lot of stress. So a lot of people are grappling with, how can I really live? Is this, is this the way I'm supposed to live? And so we're gonna really just dive into this series and, and, and look at what does God have to say about that? I, I came across this quote several years ago by a theologian, Howard Thurman, and it, it says this, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself 
what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I like that quote. I think it really identifies a, an important question that we wrestle with. What is it that makes me come alive? The part that I struggle with with that quote is I don't think we really know on our own what makes us come alive. We don't have the ability to make ourselves really come alive. And so that's the challenge in this quote. And I think and I believe and I've seen in my own life that God has this key and he unlocks this for us. And that as hard as I try to make myself come alive and to find this kind of life, I simply am not able to do it. I'm simply not built for that. But God, when we come to him, I love some of the words that the Bible describes God, the life that God gives us. If you look in your Bible, it says, when we come to him, he gives us peace. When we come to, get, come to him, there's a contentment that we find in him. There's a joy that we find in him. There's a rest in him. There's a love that's found in him. To me, that, that's a great description of life, what it is to be alive. And so we wanna look at, you know, what is it? How do we tap into this life that God wants to give us? So we're gonna, just like good preachers do, we're gonna do an acrostic with the word real, R-E-A-L, and today we're gonna look at the first letter, R. And we're gonna let the R is gonna stand for reject. And meaning there are some things that if we wanna really live, we have to learn to reject some things. We have to learn how to say no to some things if we wanna experience the life God wants to give us. Now, the word no is a really simple word. Let's, let's just see if, uh, on three, I'm gonna count to three, let's just see if we can say the word no together, okay? Let's just see if we can do that, okay, ready? One, two, three, no. Y'all, did, y'all give yourselves a hand, that was awesome. Y'all have the ability to say no, that is beautiful. We're gonna talk about how we wanna use that word today a little bit, that this is actually a pretty important word for us to look at. So Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 37, he said, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So it's a pretty simple idea, but it's kind of profound too. Because as I think about my own life, sometimes I say yes with my mouth, but inside my heart is really like, no, I don't wanna do that, but I just said yes. And I don't really do it in practice. I really need to learn how to use this tool, this weapon that God gave me, this word no is important. 20 or so years ago when I was doing youth ministry, I was the junior high minister at that time and we were at our old building, we're at this campus and I was in this kind of open office area. It was me and a guy named Matt Carter who was here a few weeks ago that actually came and preached and we were working and I was on a phone call one day And Matt, you know, we kind of could hear each other whenever we were doing stuff. And so Matt was kind of listening in and I was on this call. Somebody was trying to convince me to go do something and it was clear that I really didn't want to go and really couldn't go. And so I'm on there, I'm like, okay, so, uh, yeah, so it's uh, this Thursday night, okay. Um, You know, um, I I, I, I probably, maybe, uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that this Thursday. Yeah, thanks for letting me know about it. Okay, okay, see ya, bye. I hung up the phone, Matt's like, Dude, you know there is no way in the world you are going to that thing. Like, what are you doing? Why didn't you just say, no, I can't go? And I was like, it's so hard. It's just so hard to say no to somebody. Gosh, you know, and so that, that has definitely been a struggle for me. And yet, how many of y'all, if, if you're a parent in here, you, your kids learn this word pretty well, right? Are there any parents, uh, you've, you've raised kids? Kids are pretty good at this word, no, right? As soon as they can speak, it's like, mama or dada, and then it's no, I don't like this. Eat your vegetables, no, no, I don't wanna do it, no. Like they they use that word a lot, right? And so kids learn this word early on. And it's an important word that we're supposed to carry on into adulthood. We're, We're meant to be able to use that. And I think even in today's society, it's so important. We live in a day and age where there's so many like limitless information around us. There's so many choices, there's so many things competing for us, for our time, for our attention. We have to learn to say no. So I'm gonna look at like three different areas 
and that I think will help us put us in a place where we can really live. But we need to learn how to say no in some areas. So number one, there in your handout, is that we need to learn to say no to others, meaning other people. We need to learn to say no to others. And in parentheses, it says, we are to be responsible to others, not for others. And so again, God has a sense of humor, the fact that for sure that I am teaching on this topic because I am a massive people pleaser. I love saying yes way too much. Not only am I a people pleaser, I'm also a procrastinator. And I'm not a planner. There's a lot of P's here going on here at this point. So all that mounts up. I say yes a lot when I shouldn't. And then I fill up my calendar and all this stuff. And then when it comes, comes time to follow through on all those yeses, I, I end up being depleted and I'm running out of time. I'm running out of energy, running out of money. And I'm not in a good place. So I, I need a lot of work in this area. In the early days of my marriage, my wife had a phrase that still sticks with me today like she just said it. As I was saying yes to all these things, all these good things, she looked at me one day, she said, Brian, stop, slow down. Brian, you realize every time that you say yes to someone else, you're saying no to me. It's like, ooh, ouch, I didn't think of it that way, right? And so she kinda, kinda felt some conviction from that. And so we need to hear about this. And so I wanna look at this passage. Galatians 6, I think, has some insight here. It's in your handout if you wanna look at it, it'll be on the screen. In Galatians 6, it says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. So I, I love that, there, there's, a, there's actually a lot in there for us, I think, with this saying no to other people. So real quick, the context of this, if we look at chapter five right before it, it says that the whole law can be kind of summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. So it's clear as Christians, we're supposed to go love people. And then chapter six is an application of that. In this specific chapter, it's a situation where a brother, or could be a sister, is caught in sin. They're, they're caught in sin and they're struggling and they wanna get out of it, but they can't. It's saying, you need to come alongside of them and help bear those burdens. And it says, and as you're doing that, you need to do it in a humble way. Don't compare yourself. Don't be like walking alongside them and say, I can't believe you're struggling with that. I would never struggle with that sin. Ugh. Come on, like you don't need to have an attitude of pride, just have a humble attitude of like love. Like you wanna help someone get back on track with the Lord. That's a good thing to love people. And then it says, you should have a healthy sense of pride in that you should carry your own load, your own daily responsibility. So here's kind of our takeaway, I think, for this point. Sometimes in life there are burdens, it describes in that first verse, in verse two. That word burden means an excessive burden, a heavy load. So there are times when someone comes to you and they have a heavy burden on them. And as a Christian, we should, you know, if we're able to, we should try to come along and help them. There's some things that are too heavy for us to carry. But then there are other situations where the other word it has there, it says your load, your daily load. That is like, means like a backpack, a small backpack that you would wear. And that means we all have our own responsibilities that are ours to take care of, right? That we need to handle. Like if I dirtied up a dish, then I need to put it in the sink and wash it off, right? Not somebody else. If I you know, have trash, I need to throw it away. Like we need to deal with our own stuff, our own emotions, take responsibility for that. I remember a few years ago, I've got two sons and a daughter, my two sons, the older one was, they were hanging out. He was with my younger son, uh, Samuel, and Josh, the older, was like, hey, Samuel, can you, go, uh, can you go grab my phone for me? I think it's upstairs. And so Samuel's like, okay. So he goes upstairs and gets Josh's phone, brings it back to him. And, and then this may have happened again. Hey, Samuel, can you get my phone for me? And Samuel went up. And we kind of, as parents, caught wind of this. We're like, pulled Samuel aside. We said, Samuel, 
You don't have to get your brother's phone every time he asks you to get it. And so our, our young son, Samuel, listen, and he's a very strong personality. He is really little, but he's a fireball. He's like, oh, okay. And that was all it took. So the next time that happened, I mean, he, you could have heard it anywhere in the house. We hear like, it's your phone, Josh, you go get it. I'm not getting your phone. We're like, wow, man, he was empowered. And uh, that's, that is all it took and that, that never happened again. And so he learned how to say no to something that wasn't necessarily his responsibility. And I think that's what this is saying is we need to ask the Lord for discernment. Sometimes we need to enter in and help someone that's going through an extremely difficult time. I love the Good Samaritan story, right? That was a heavy burden. That was something that this guy literally was robbed and his stuff was taken. He was injured at a situation beyond his, you know, what he could do. Sometimes we need to be willing to love people through those. Sometimes though, people are just being irresponsible. And if we are to do everything they want us to do, we're enabling them. And that is not helping them at all. And so in parentheses, it's a good way to remember it is, we are to be responsible to others, but not for others. There's a great book, if you wanna write this down, if you've never read it, it's a classic called Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. If you have people-pleasing tendencies, this needs to be on your must read list. You need to read it like tonight, okay? Uh, so, but there's a quote from that I'll, I'll read now. It says, problems arise when people act as if their boulders or their burdens are just daily loads and they refuse help. Or as if their daily loads are boulders that they shouldn't have to carry. The results of these two instances are either perpetual pain or irresponsibility. Lest we stay in pain or become irresponsible, it's very important to determine what me is, where my boundary of responsibility is, and where someone else's begins. So why do we struggle with this inability to say no to other people? I think one of the reasons that I put in here in your handout is that doing things for others makes us feel good about ourselves and less guilty. Feel like we did our good deed. We did something nice for someone else. We gave in to them. But here's the deal, we are not called to give out of guilt. That's not to be our motivator. We are to give out of love. That's what the Lord wants from us. There's another example from the Boundaries book. He, he says this, a man telephoned his mother and she answered her phone very weakly with hardly any voice at all. Concerned, thinking she was sick, he asked her, mother, what is wrong? Uh, I guess my voice doesn't work very well anymore, she replied. No one ever calls me since you children left home. Wow. That's a mom who is brilliant at the guilt trip manipulation. That is, that is like, you know, give her an award for that acting job, right? Sometimes people do that to us. It's so, like the guilt trip is the worst, right? The Boundaries gives a few other examples of guilt trips. Maybe you've heard some of these. How could you do this to me after all I have done for you? Wow. Mm. If you really loved me, you would make this telephone call for me. Mm, really? You know that if I had it, I would give it to you. Oh, man. Or I thought Christians were supposed to think of others. Yeah, boy, that's slow, right? Maybe some of y'all have gotten those guilt trips before. So what do we do when people play that guilt trip card on us? I, I love this passage from Romans 8. It's in your handout. I think it's a good one to remember when you feel like you're trying to be manipulated by a guilt trip. It says in 8, 1 through 2, so now there is no condemnation or guilt for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So I, I love that. So as a child of God, be, remember this. Before God, you are not guilty or condemned anymore. That was taken care of. You stand not condemned anymore. You are forgiven and you are made right with God because the perfect son of God came and paid that penalty in full for you. So every morning you wake up, every day you go about your life, 
you are not condemned before God as a child of God. So stand upon that. So that means when other people try to make you feel guilty, they don't have that power over you. They don't have the power to declare you guilty or not guilty. We need to be shored up on this foundation that there is no condemnation in Christ. And we have, a, we have the power. It says to this life-giving spirit in verse two, we've been free to go love and to, to make decisions and, and we have the power to say yes to things and no to things. People do not have the authority over us to decide that for us. So that's important to be empowered there. Another great verse, I think, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so this was specifically talking about, you know, sharing mo money or monetary things, but also I think it applies to when you give your energy, <clears throat> when you give your time, <clears throat> God loves a cheerful giver. One other little illustration from Boundaries says this. Stan was confused. He read in the Bible and was taught in church that it was more blessed to give than to receive. But he found that this often was not true. He frequently felt unappreciated for all he was doing. He wished people would have more consideration for his time and energy. Yet whenever someone wanted something from him, he would do it. He thought this was loving and he wanted to be a loving person. Finally, when the fatigue grew into depression, he came to see me. When asked what was wrong, Stan replied that he was loving too much. How can you love too much, I asked. I've never heard of such a thing. Oh, it's very simple, replied Stan. I do far more for people than I should, and that makes me very depressed. I'm not quite sure what you're doing, I said, but it certainly isn't love. The Bible says that true love leads to a blessed state and a state of cheer. Love brings happiness, not depression. If your loving is depressing you, it's probably not love. So we need to learn to say no to things or people that we have decided not to give to, and that's perfectly okay. God wants us to be a cheerful giver, not someone who's being coerced or guilt-tripped or manipulated into other people's desire to control us. God says, be a cheerful giver. So what happens when we don't say no to others? If we just, we have no restraint here. I think not saying no to the agendas and wishes of others will lead to stress and feeling burned out. And that is not the real life that God has for you and me. All right, number two. Number two, no that we need to learn, I think, is we need to learn to say no to yourself. Learn to say no to yourself. First Timothy 4, seven through eight says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. I think this is an interesting piece of advice because we kind of think this was 2,000 years ago. And Paul takes the time to warn Timothy, Timothy, there's a lot of distractions in your world. This is pre-electricity, pre-internet. Like, gosh, what do you have to do, right? He's saying there's godless myths and there's old wives' tales circulating around. You gotta discipline yourself, Timothy. Don't give in to that. You gotta say no to some of that stuff. You gotta focus your attention. Train yourself for godliness. And think about our world today, right? How many more distractions do we have today, right? We all have supercomputers in our pockets right now that can lead us into limitless rabbit trails, old wives' tales, TikTok tales, YouTube shorts, conspiracy theories, Amazon deals, Pinterest, so many things, right, that can just take away all our time, all of our attention. And it could, be, it could be just wasted away. For most of us, if we're honest, we fail to say no to ourselves, meaning that we have failed to put limits on things like our phone, TV, et cetera. And I think it's robbing us of the real life that God has for us. So why do we struggle with this one? 
I think, again, it's the limitless distractions that we have in our world today. And these dopamine triggers at our fingertips, dopamine is kind of that pleasure center of our brain. These things are cleverly designed to stimulate our brain. And we have to kind of, that's why we get notifications and all these things. It's like, oh, it's rewarding to our brain to get those things. There's a, a quote from John Mark Comer's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, that I really, really love on this topic. <clears throat> it says this, what are you giving your attention to? <clears throat> because what you give your attention to is the person that you become. Put another way, the mind is the portal to the soul. What you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. It's kind of scary. That bodes well for those apprentices of Jesus who give the bulk of their attention to him and to all that is good, beautiful, and true in his world. But not for those who give their attention to the 24-7 news cycle of outrage and anxiety and emotion-charged drama or the nonstop feed of celebrity gossip, titillation, and cultural drivel. As if we give it in the first place, much of it is stolen by a clever algorithm out to monetize our precious attention. But again, we become what we give our attention to for better or for worse. It's pretty convicting for me. Attention is that commodity that the world wants more than anything because they realize that's who we become. When they can get our attention, they have us. For our, for our midweek study this semester on Wednesday nights, <clears throat> we did this book, uh, Ruthless Elimination Hurry by John Marks Comer, and we did, there's a study that goes with it. And we were challenged in very practical ways to say no to ourselves. Some of those challenges were some of these. They, one of them was, we have to parent our phone. What does that mean? It means, you put your, just like you put your kids to bed, you put your phone to bed before you. And then you wake up before your phone wakes up. So that was one idea. One of them, a little more radical, was to turn your smartphone into a dumb phone. That was interesting. So pretty much disable most of the things your phone can do, where you reduce it down to a, a device that you can make phone calls on. So if you wanna get really radical, you could try that one. Um, and then uh, it goes into challenging us. Another way you might say no is to turn the noise off. Practice silence and solitude. Carve out times where you can just be alone and quiet. Or you wanna go more radical than that, have a Sabbath day, maybe an afternoon, start there, where you can just get out in God's creation. You can just be still. You can enjoy a good meal. You can enjoy time with family or friends and just being in God's presence. I think these are disciplines, and Paul says we have to discipline ourselves, Timothy. You have to train yourself for godliness. We are meant to put limits on the things we could do. We have to say no to these distractions. There's another verse in there. It's kind of like part of a prayer, really, in Proverbs 30, verse 8. It says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. I love that because this is a prayer of just saying, God, you know what I need. God, give me nothing more and nothing less. It reminds me that God is my designer. He is my creator. He knows how my body works. He knows how my brain works. I don't know. He knows that I need a certain amount of hours of sleep or else if I try to, if I try to take shortcuts that it's gonna come back and bite me. Um, God has built us with limits. We are weak creatures and he is our designer. And so I think some of this saying no to yourself means, look, you aren't meant to be your own God. You're not meant to write your own rules. Like you need limits. And God is the one that knows us better than anyone else. So put some limits on yourself. Carve out space for God. Learn to say no to your indulgences and the, all these distractions. And what happens if we don't say no to ourselves? I think that if we not saying no to ourselves leads to a life of wasted potential. I think that's a sad thing to waste your life, waste your time. Because I think life is a really precious gift and we can easily take it for granted. So learn to say no to yourselves, to put yourself in a better place to give your attention to God. 
And then number three <coughs> is learn to say no <clears throat> to the world's version of life. <clears throat> if we go all the way back to the first story, it's amazing how much is packed in there, right? Adam and Eve. There was this lie from the serpent that is still this pull to all of us, all humanity. And the lie is that there is real life. There is life outside of a relationship with God. You're missing out on an Adam and Eve. And we're still inundated with that, right? Billboards and messages and phones that listen to us and give us some commercial or some advertisement right after we say something that's kind of freaky. I mean, all these messages, right, are coming to us saying, you're missing out, you need this. Buy this, do this. It's the same thing the serpent was doing. It's like, Adam and Eve, look. Look at this tree. I mean, look at that fruit. It looks so amazing. It's gotta be good, right? And, and this leads to power and knowledge and lots of cool things. You're missing out if you don't go for it. And of course, Adam and Eve got pulled into that. And we struggle in the same way. We feel like, we're missing out maybe on something. Maybe there is real life out there. So we have to learn to say no to the messages of the world, the temptations that come at us. I love this verse in John 12, 24 through 25. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, <clears throat> unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So this context of this verse, it's the final week of Jesus's earthly life. He's in Jerusalem. Later on that week, he's gonna go physically die on a cross. And he uses this picture of a seed. I think I have a seed here in my pocket somewhere if I can find it. It's very small, okay. Of course, y'all can't see this. Y'all can see it right here. What kind of seed is that, do you know? Pumpkin seed, good job, guys. Yeah, pumpkin seed, very good. Y'all know your seeds, I'm very impressed. So Jesus used this picture of a seed and it's really a very small, not very exciting, bland thing to look at. God gives us seeds and we have a choice. We can hold on to it like a souvenir uh, and keep it in our pocket, in a jar on our desk, just to look at and admire. <clears throat> or we can give up the seed, put it in the ground and discover what its real purpose is to become something far greater and bigger than it is now. And I think this is the choice that God gives each of us with our life. We can hold on to our life, we could do it our way, live our own version of life, or he says, hey, or you can, you can give it to me. You can bring yourself to me, kind of like that seed planted in the ground and see I'm gonna do something so much bigger and so much greater and more beautiful than you could ever, ever imagine. But it's your choice. You can hold on to the seed or you can give it up. And I think that's the power of the choice that we have. But we have to learn to say no to that pull of the world to think, I don't know, I don't know if I wanna trust God, I don't know if I wanna give that to the Lord. So why do we struggle? Why do we struggle? Uh, I think it's envy. Envy is a very real thing. It's, you know, you see it all the way through the Bible, the story of the Bible, people struggle with envy. And that FOMO, right, fear of missing out. There's a Psalm in there, Psalm, it's supposed to be Psalm 73. I, I mistyped that, I apologize. So Psalm 73 talks about envy, but ironically, Psalm 37 does also talk about envy from David's perspective, but this one, it says, it's Asaph who wrote this. He says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I love the imagery saying, I've got this foothold, I'm planted on the goodness of God, <clears throat> on who he is and I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to live the life he has for me, but I started to slip. Envy started to pull me, started to believe some of these lies that maybe there's life out there. And he says, no, I'm gonna reestablish my foothold. And I think that's 
a good picture of every day we have to say no to those temptations, no to those lies. And we gotta stand firm on God's goodness. We sing about how he is good, right? He is. I have a friend who's challenged me uh, in the way that he prays. He says, when I was a younger Christian, I used to pray for what I wanted from God. He says, now I have learned to just pray God's will. He says, over time, I've seen that whatever God does, whatever he brings into my life is so much bigger and greater and more amazing than anything I could want. I love that. It's challenged me to trust God totally, that he is good. There's no, it says every good and perfect gift comes from him. His character is trustworthy. He is faithful and he is good. Don't believe the lies that there's life outside of him. So what happens if we don't say no to the temptations of the world? Not saying no to the ways of the world leads down a path of self-destruction. One final verse is John 10, 10. It says, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I love that verse. I have it framed in my office. It serves as a constant reminder to me to say no to the temptations of the ruler of this world, the thief, the devil, and to say yes to Jesus. The path of Jesus is the path of real life. I'll kind of wrap up with this. I was yesterday, got to go and uh, see Sam Houston's football team win their very first football game all season long. So that was exciting to get to see a victory there. My daughter goes to school there. Uh, but not only that, was my youngest son. He is, loves football. He's never really gotten to go to a college football game. So it was his first game he got to go to. And they won in dramatic fashion. It was so fun. They like, you know, it was like five seconds left. They kicked the game-winning field goal. We got to celebrate. So it was really fun. But while we were there, we uh, also were in Huntsville. And we went to, we did some geocaching, which is kind of like treasure hunting. You got a little app. And so we, my son loves to do that too. So we went to this old cemetery where Sam Houston is buried. And so we, we went there and we, we walked all around. We ended up finding the geocache finally. It was really cool. And we were about to leave and my daughter was like, Dad, I saw there's like this really beautiful, cool like statue that's here somewhere in the cemetery of Jesus. It's like this really rare uh, bronze statue that was done. It's an original by this Danish artist. And there's very few of them in America. You can go see one right here in Huntsville. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And so my daughter and I just start running all over the cemetery, trying to find this thing. And just couldn't find, I even pulled out my phone. Like I, uh, there's a thing called a compass. I was getting in touch with my Boy Scout days again. And I was like, I think it, maybe it's over this way and that we couldn't find it. And but we're about to give up. And finally we found this little, they called a sanctuary in the woods there. And there's this little path. And sure enough, there's this incredible statue of Jesus this bronze statue, his hands are up, and you see this message of peace I leave with you, and it talks about let not your heart be troubled, just some references from some of the things he said. And it was just a cool picture to me as I was reflecting on that. You know, I was thinking about where Jesus says, look, the road, the road is wide that the world is on, and it leads to destruction. This, this world and all the things and all the messages and all these things, it's, it's wide. There is another road that's narrow, but it's open to anybody who wants to come. That's the road, the pathway that leads to Jesus. And the thing is, that pathway, if you're willing to walk it, you will discover what you were created for. It was such a place of peace and that reminder of when we take that road to Jesus, when we give him our life, we find real life in him. And so I just kind of leave you with that. And today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you have your um, little cup here and the uh, cracker, you can grab that now. Um, but as we think about this, as we set this up today, you know, Jesus had to say no as well. I think about when he was tempted by the devil. Right, right at the very beginning of his ministry, 
the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he's fasting for 40 days and the devil comes at him with this alternative route. He's like, hey, you can have all the kingdoms of the world, you can do this, you can, you can get out of the cross, you could do, do it my way. Here's another version of life. Doesn't that sound great? And Jesus very firmly quoted from the word of God and said, no, 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 I'm not gonna do that. And Jesus committed all the way, he lived a perfect life, followed the Father's will, and he was that seed. His life went into the ground, he, went in, he was buried, he died for us so that God brought forth this entire new reality for us, like so much bigger and greater, we can't even describe it. That like God made a way for us to be made right with him. It changed our whole eternity, it changed our, our, our destinies, even our life here on earth is completely changed. This gospel, this good news is affecting, it, it has ramifications on our personal lives, on our relationships, on systems, on governments. It's, this, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened because he followed through. And so today, we, as we celebrate communion, we do this once a month so that we can remember what he's done for us. Give our attention to that, right? Not, we give our attention to a lot of things, but it's good as a church to give our attention to what Jesus has done for us. And so the night before he would go to the cross, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples. They had no clue really still what was going on. And they were having this Passover meal. They had followed him for three years now. And Jesus held up the bread and he broke the bread and gave it a whole new meaning. He said, look, this bread is my body, which is gonna be broken for you. And he says, take and eat this in remembrance of me. And then he held up the cup and again gave it a whole new meaning. He says, look, this is my blood, which is gonna be shed for you. This is the blood of a new covenant. God is doing something brand new to change everything. I'm doing this for you. He said, if you do this, there's forgiveness of sins. But we become part of the family of God and we have fellowship with him through this new covenant. He said, take and drink. Well, let's pray. Lord God, Thank you so much for what you've done for us. That Jesus, you came and nothing would stop you. You had to say no to a lot of things. You had to say no to a lot of shortcuts and the easy way. But you went all the way to the cross and you faced death. You drank the cup of God's wrath for us when we didn't deserve it. I mean, I think about your word says that even while we were enemies, while we were still sinners, you died for us. Even when people were yelling at the cross, take yourself down and all these insults, you just kept saying, Father, forgive them for they know that what they do. There's no one in this world that has loved us like that, that has done that for us. May we not give ourselves, give our attention to anyone else, but you, you are worthy of us in our attention, Lord. And maybe you're here today and you've, you're looking for real life, maybe. You're, you're trying to figure it out and, and it's not worked so far. You can enter into the life of Jesus. In some ways, it's very simple and yet it's profound. It's simple in the fact that he has done it for you. It is a gift, you can't ever earn it. You just simply say, Jesus, I wanna give you my life. I turn from my old way of living, from all my mistakes and my sin. I give it to you. I put my trust fully in you. Be my savior. I believe you died and you rose again. Make me into the person that you want me to be and he will forever change you. And your life will never be the same. Your eternity will never be the same. So if that's you, maybe today's the day that you do that. We ask all this in Jesus' name.